Japan Station is made possible in part by Patreon support. If you would like to make sure that I can keep bringing you more content like this, then head on over to japankyo.com slash Patreon and sign up for as little as $1 a month. <laughs> Welcome to Japan Station, a production of Japankyo.com. I'm your host, Tony Vega. So today I've got a full-length episode for you. Yay! I know last time it was a short one and, well, it couldn't be avoided because it was an in-person backstage interview with Miyavi. Limited amount of time. Um, if you haven't checked that out already, go do that. But like I said today, full-length episode. So my guest today is baseball historian and expert on all things Japanese baseball, Robert Fitz. He has written numerous books about Japanese baseball and baseball players who have played in Japan. Um, and actually, the book that caught my attention and, well, really made me want to talk to Robert and reach out is called Banzai Babe Ruth, Baseball, Espionage, and Assassination During the 1934 Tour of Japan. So Babe Ruth and a team of American baseball players went to Japan to play uh, in 1934. And that story is fascinating. I listened to an online lecture that Robert gave. And so I put that in my uh, list of people that I wanted to talk to. And I finally got around to talking to Robert and it turned out to be super interesting. But we also talk about a bunch of other things that he has worked on and is working on, including this really interesting book about the history of Japanese baseball cards. Um, like this stuff is super interesting. And to, to be perfectly honest, I don't particularly care about sports in general. Like I don't watch sports, but I can appreciate a good story regardless of whether it's it's about hockey or baseball or whatever it is a good story is a good story i love history and i love learning about these little quirks of how things work in japan versus like baseball cards here for example right the baseball market card in japan versus here and by here i mean the u.s where i live so um i i love learning about this stuff so even if you're not into baseball i i think this is a pretty interesting episode for you to check out don't tune out give it a try so anyway let's get into it here is my chat with robert fitz the next stop is japan station the doors on the right side will open like you like baseball <laughs> <laughs> yes i do <laughs> so um just curious how, how did you get into uh well baseball but specifically baseball in japan history and all that what was your your you know thing did something happen were you in japan and then a baseball hit you and you oh, i want to know more about this like what what happened <laughs> all right well actually i have stories for each of them okay um, I started getting baseball. I remember it's, I think it was, uh, it was third grade. Yeah. Um, and I come from a family that has no interest in sports. Uh -huh. So I do not have memories of watching baseball with my parents. Oh. Uh, instead, I came from, from kind of a strange uh, way is on the, at recess on the school playgrounds, kids were playing uh, baseball card games and, um, they started out flipping them, but oh. then they started doing this game where they would toss them in the air and oh. watch all of us crazy people try to catch them or, or grab them and fight over them. Oh, wow. And that was what the kids did at recess for a while. And I thought that was a lot of fun. So I did that. Uh -huh. And I started getting a group of baseball cards. And I knew, you know, just all I knew about from baseball was just from like osmosis, you know, what you pick up in the news. Right. Um, and so I started going, who are these guys? And uh, just reading up on the baseball cards. And for some reason, I became fascinated by them. Uh -huh. And uh, a few months later, I started spending my uh, you know, nickel or quarter allowance, whatever it was back then, on uh, wax packs of baseball cards. This was in 1975. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, got real lucky that the Phillies, who, of course, were – horrible for 10 years prior <laughs> we're finally having a winning season uh -huh. so everybody all the kids were talking about the phillies and the phillies players so it was really easy to start to get into baseball and to become a phillies fan back in oh, 1975 okay. 
So that's where it all started. And it didn't take more than a few months for me to become a, a baseball crazy kid. <laughs> um, and it started through baseball cards. Oh, okay. And then that continued. Um, you know, in high school, I wasn't terribly interested in them, and more in college. Uh -huh. um, but when I was in graduate school, I was playing on the soft. I always played softball, so I was uh -huh. playing on the softball team in graduate school. And uh, the guys were all talking about this guy named Bo Jackson and oh, how amazing he was. I remember Bo Jackson, yeah. And I hadn't watched a baseball game since the mid 1980s. Mm -hmm. um, I was always into my own sports and just kind of didn't think much about professional baseball back then. But I watched the uh, 1989 All Star game mm -hmm. with Bo Jackson, and it just rekindled all my old passions. And oh. the next thing I did is I went to a baseball card store, uh -huh. which they had in the 80s, they didn't have it when I started collecting, of course, yeah. and bought. Uh, a box of 1989 baseball cards, Tots baseball cards. Uh -huh. And that started me collecting again in my early twenties. Oh wow! So through my early twenties, I had barely heard of Japanese baseball. Mm -hmm. um, I actually did have one Japanese baseball card that I picked up about 1977 um, oh. at a baseball card show just because it was cool, but I had <laughs> no idea what it was. Yeah. Um, by curiosity, but, do you know do you know who was on the card now? I I do now. It was uh, Matoshi Fujita, who uh -huh. was uh, is a Hall of Fame pitcher yeah. uh, for the Omiri Giants, and he was a uh, manager of the Omiri Giants oh. during uh, some of the eighties and I think early nineties, maybe. Uh -huh. Um, I still have it actually. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> it still has. It's in a. It's in one of my. Uh, more than binders, I have also scrapbooks of uh, the really good stuff and memories. Nice. It's, it's back there in prize, you know, yeah, position. Yeah. Um, so um, after I was married in uh, the early 1990s, my wife was a Japanese studies major uh -huh. and had spent a year uh, with AFS in southern Japan in high school. Uh -huh. And she was at that point, um, still is fluent in Japanese. And uh, she was transferred over to Tokyo. And um, I was in graduate school, finishing up my dissertation. And so I really could be anywhere in the world. So I said, mm. yeah, that sounds great. Let's go. So I flew over there. She was over there almost a month before I was. And uh, I did the long flight. You know, I'm, I'm sure you've done it. It's shorter yeah. from Hawaii. You're lucky. <laughs> yeah. But from New York, it's, you know, 13 yeah. hours or oh, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've, I've flown from Florida, so I know. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> um, and I don't think I slept a wink. Uh, oh. I remember watching three different movies in a row. Um, it was just brutal. Yeah. And uh, I arrive in the hotel, and I'm exhausted. And I just want to take a hot shower and go to sleep. But my wife comes back from the office and says, great, you know, you're here. Take a shower. We're going out. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Her office mates had bought us um, like box seats to a baseball game. It Whoa. was the uh -huh. Colt Swallows versus the Hanshin Tigers. And so, of course, I'm like, oh, I'm exhausted. But all right, fine. Um and so my life changed that night because I had no idea what Japanese baseball was like. And here uh -huh. we have the, the Swallows and the Tigers, um, 1993. They're both good teams. Um, and Jingo Stadium was, was really, I mean, it was rocking, literally uh -huh. rocking. It was <laughs> moving and swaying uh -huh. um, by the noise, jam-packed stadium, you know, the horns are going off the banners being waved the uh, umbrellas are going up and down i couldn't believe it yeah uh, i was like wow this is this is beyond the best baseball game i've ever been to yeah, yeah 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 um and so that night my first day in japan or first night in japan was when i started getting um back or getting introduced into japanese baseball mm -hmm. and since as you already know i'm a baseball card lover yeah. the next day my second day in japan i did not go to a museum or do any of the normal things people do uh -huh. instead i went in search of japanese baseball cards <laughs> <laughs> and i found some at the tokyo dome fan shop and oh, i nice. bought a couple of boxes and kind of went back to the hotel and opened the packs and that was my first full day in japan while my wife was at the office <laughs> <laughs> wow okay right from the beginning that that's awesome um 
and and you know like i i don't particularly follow sports in general but i have been to a hanshin tigers game and it was very fun it's the kind of thing that i don't care if you don't care about sports like it's something i think people should experience it's it's quite different from you know the the average american experience really fun you watch the crowd all the singing the drums the chanting um it's it's just it's a really cool experience so i i, I highly recommend it yes definitely mm-hmm. it's something that that unless you absolutely hate baseball yeah that almost every tourist who goes over there should just try to do. And yeah. uh, to skip forward uh, almost 30 years, uh, last time I was in Japan, which was October of uh, 2019, right before the pandemic, uh, yeah. I was in Hiroshima for a couple of days and we just happened to get tickets to the last game of the season. And uh, my wife and I went as tourists. I mean, no, we didn't No, but no, you know, no baseball connection. We just went to have fun. Yeah. And it was one of the best nights in Japan I had for decades. It was just so much fun to go out there um, and sit in the bleachers with people you don't know who befriended us and were sharing their snacks and trying to teach <laughs> us the songs. It was yeah. just wonderful. So it's a wonderful way to get to um, really, I would say, know or enjoy Japan um, just as a first time or second time tourist. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, those songs, like each each pitcher or whatever, like each each uh, no, not pit- like usually it's the batters, right? They have batters. like their own songs. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're all fun. Um, okay, and so then from from there, it seems like it it, it didn't stop. You only went deeper and deeper <laughs> and deeper and deeper. You started writing books about baseball exactly. and all that. Exactly. Um, so what what was your first book about? Uh, so the baseball. first book is called Remembering Japanese Baseball, and it's an oral history. Mm-hmm. And that came about, um, once again, everything in my life comes to the baseball cards. Mm-hmm. Oh. So I, um, when I was there in the 90s, I, I started collecting the Japanese baseball cards, and it became kind of a passion. Mm-hmm. And eventually, um, about 1999, I opened an eBay store. Uh, hmm. selling Japanese baseball cards. Wow. And you were ahead of the game. Jeez. I was. Yeah. I was. Um, and I did that because I started getting a lot of doubles. Uh-huh. Um, I started to figure out that the best way to build a, a good collection was to buy in bulk. Yeah. Um, find somebody who had a lot, who didn't want them anymore, and just buy everything. Um, now, back then, eBay was just starting. Yeah. So... Um, you really, you didn't have the variety. I remember I did a search on Japanese baseball and I would buy almost everything that came up. I mean, it was that, you, were you know, the guy. <laughs> well, there were other guys, but okay. I was one of them. Yeah. Um, and so when I was building this business, I wanted to know more about the players. And yeah. I, I don't really speak Japanese. When I lived there, I spoke enough to kind of get by, yeah. uh, but, but I have forgotten it and I don't read it. Um, so I couldn't go back to the sources to, to read about the history of these players I was collecting. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, why don't I talk to Americans who know these guys? Mm-hmm. And I put together a list of, um, of Americans who played in Japan. Mm-hmm. And through Google, before people cared about privacy, yeah. I was able to track down their telephone <laughs> numbers and their addresses. And uh, I contacted them. Wow. And the vast majority of these former players were, were just very happy to talk about Japan. Yeah. Um, this is before Hideo Nomo came over in, in uh, 19, uh, sorry, um, yeah, 1995. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I'm sorry, I started the book after Hideo Nomo came over. But when, I, when um, even at that time, there was not the knowledge um in the United States about Japanese baseball that there right. is today. Mm-hmm. So the players were happy to talk about this. And so I started interviewing these players in English and talking about both their time there, but also um, the players, the Japanese players and details about their lives. Mm-hmm. And the most important person I met during this um, book was a fellow by the name of Wally Yodamine. Mm-hmm. And Wally, I don't know if you've heard of him. Uh, mm-hmm. He was a Hawaiian. Mm. Hawaiian Japanese. Mm. He is, um, if you go to the airport still, to the um, the gate that goes off to Japan, mm. uh, you will see a display case with oh. his trophies and uniforms. Oh, 
I will check that next time I'm there. <laughs> check it out. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, and I uh, I think this week is actually the Wally Yonamine Baseball Championships in Japan in uh, Hawaii right now. Oh, geez. Okay. That, I don't so know. he's someone I you should, should know, know about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Wally became actually, he played for the San Francisco 49ers for one season. Uh-huh. Uh, so he played professional football and then he switched over because of an injury to professional baseball. Uh-huh. And he went off to Japan um, in 1951 and uh, became really the first American star since World War II. Mm-hmm. And he helped transform Japanese baseball by bringing a very aggressive style, which he had learned in professional football, to, oh. to the diamond. Uh-huh. So my first book, I interviewed Wally, and he was a master storyteller <laughs> and, uh, and a wonderful human being as well. And uh, that led to my second book, because with no joke, everybody overuses the word literally now. But <laughs> literally, the day after I turned in the manuscript of the first book, I called Wally Yonamine and said, could I write your biography? <laughs> because uh, he had a story that needed to be told. Yeah. And that day was, was also the day I switched from being a baseball card seller who wrote a book to being an author and saying, okay, this is yeah. now my profession. This is what I love to do more than anything else. Oh, wow. Um, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, someone. Is it, um, he, he played quite early on, I think, baseball in Japan, but Mike Salomko? Sure. Yeah. Yep. He- I, I I've met him. He he used to come to Hawaii often. He still he's he's up there in the years, but he's he's still around. And I through oh, my good. job at a magazine here, I've gotten to talk to him several times. I learned about his story. Fascinating guy. Um, like I I get the from what I've seen of, of the people that end up going to Japan, they tend to have like a really interesting story, like how they end up there. And then, you know, you, especially when they're early on, you know, like these people that were around like before the internet, you know? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And that's why I love that about the book. So I, I interviewed a f- number of uh, a Hawaiian Japanese actually uh-huh. for that book. And, uh, and I spent a lot of time in, uh, in Honolulu for oh, about nice. five years. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. Um, and my wife always jokes. She'd say, oh, she'd tell her friends, you know, where's Rob? And he's like, oh, he's in Honolulu for the week. And they look <laughs> at him like, you let your husband go to Honolulu? He's like, don't worry. He's up at uh, University of Hawaii Library because it's the best library I've ever seen in the world. <laughs> so I really do get off the airplane and go straight to the library. <laughs> yeah, it's like there's, there, there was like, I mean, it's, I think it's still, yeah, I think they still do games, but um, like a, a second generation Japanese, like a Nikkei baseball league. There's a big baseball culture in the Japanese community here. Yes, there is. Yes. Yeah. So there, yeah. there's its, its own history. And I'm sure, you know, that that led to people, some <clears throat> probably going to the major leagues, some going to Japan and, and you know, the, of course, the whole complicated history with World War II and all that. But, you right. know, yeah, like I've, I've heard a lot about that. I've read a, a bit about that. And it's it's very interesting in its own right. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, OK, so then. Uh, now I I discovered you through the lecture that you did about uh uh Bonsai Bay Bruce the the mm-hmm. book that you wrote and that is a whole fascinating story I'm I'm sure we could have spent like the whole hour just talking about that but um could could you give us an overview of, of what that book is about and then maybe we can get into a, a few of the details Sure yeah. um so in 1934, Babe Ruth and a team of um, American League All-Stars went to Japan uh, for an 18-game tour. And they played against a All-Star team of Japanese players who was brought together by the Yomiuri newspaper. Mm. And that team um, ended up transforming the following year into the Yomiuri Giants, which of mm. course is the modern um premier baseball team or well one of the most popular teams let's call it you just got the people angry (laughs) i I was about to say and and they have a right they have a right to be angry yeah yeah. i'm a historian i I know they're they're compared to the yankees right i know they're yeah yes yes they are um so the team went over this is um i'm sorry the uh all americans went over in the uh fall of uh, 1934 to play baseball. Mm-hmm. But what I do with the book is 
I try to talk not only about baseball, but the political situation. Yeah, yeah. So what's fascinating about this tour is um, Japan and the United States attentions are extremely high between the two countries. Mm -hmm. And there is talk of war. There's mm -hmm. serious talk of war on both sides. And the baseball team goes over and a half a million people show up to welcome them. And the mm. joy that they brought uh, to Japan while they played was, was just amazing. Mm. And it was remarked upon by newspapers all across the world, you know, obviously in Japan and in the United States, but in London talked about it and, and other places. And uh, it was a real diplomatic coup trying to bring the countries closer together. Oh, wow. Obviously, didn't last very long. As a matter of fact, it lasted about two months at most mm -hmm. um, after the end of the tour. But when I write about, started writing this book, I thought I would, um, well, let me backtrack a second. When I got the idea for this book, um, I was researching it and I was thinking, okay, so this is a significant baseball event, but I don't know if I want to write a book about, okay, they went here, they played, and this is what happened, and they went there. I need some sort of plot. So I was doing um, some background reading, and I was reading a book on um, the beginnings of World War II, and I came across a reference uh, to an attempted coup d'etat um, in um, the fall of 1934. Mm -hmm. And um, when I read that, I thought, oh boy, now I have a story. Mm -hmm. So I went back and I approached Bonsai Babe Ruth almost like a thriller. The mm -hmm. idea was um, the book would have three parts. One part follows the baseball team, and that's obviously the, the meat of the book. Mm -hmm. Another part follows um, the army officers who are attempting the coup while the baseball team is in Japan. Mm -hmm. And a third part talks about a right-wing, um, almost terrorist group that ends up trying to assassinate um, the organizer of the tour um, and owner of the Yomiuri uh, newspaper, uh, Shiriki. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I write the book by alternating chapters to try to set up some tension and make it a hopefully a, a more interesting read than if it was just a, a baseball yeah. Straight baseball book. So so the attempt to assassinate the, the organizer of the tour, um, was that because he was like being friendly to, to the West and inviting these outsiders during this time of tension? Like what was the, the, the motivation there? Well, you know, it's interesting because if you read the sources at the time, mm -hmm. um, they claim that he the attempted assassination was because he had brought Babe Ruth and the Bear, American baseball players um, into Meiji, Meiji Shrine, oh. and he had defiled the name of the uh, emperor. Uh -huh. In reality, um, great work by a another historian who I'm sorry, my name escapes me right now because I wrote mm -hmm. the uh, Bonsai Babe Ruth almost 12 years ago now. <laughs> um, but this, this, this man's work showed that Actually, what was going on was um, a lot of um, underworld connections and, um, and, and newspaper rivalries. And so oh. that Shiriki was actually, the attempted assassination, had more to do with um, internal Japanese politics than it, than it did uh, world politics. Uh -huh. um, so... I'm afraid I do not remember the exact details <laughs> right oh, now. Uh, we'll yeah. both have to go back to the book and reread it. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's that's okay. Um, so another really interesting angle about about the story that that was brought up during the lecture was it seems like there was somebody on the the American team, the the Babe Ruth team, that might have been a spy, perhaps. Like, like perhaps, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. It, like it seems like the evidence is in that you know indicates that, but there's no complete one hundred percent confirmation, right? Correct. So this yeah. man's name was Mo Berg, and he's one of the most beloved, I will call, characters in uh -huh. American baseball. Uh, Mo Berg was a graduate of Princeton and the Sorbonne in Paris. Uh -huh. uh, he was a whiz at languages. Um, people claim that he could speak a dozen. That's not quite true, but he uh -huh. certainly could speak a, a many. Uh -huh. um, 
he was a, a brilliant man. He really was. Mm -hmm. um, he went along with the tour. And later, during World War II, he did become a spy. He worked mm. for the OSS, the United States government. Uh, he was sent to Italy. Um, he even had a mission to um, assassinate Heisenberg, the German physicist, mm. if he thought Heisenberg was close to uh, completing his work on the atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. um, there are there's a fabulous documentary um, out by him uh, about him. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I think it's called The Spy Behind Home Plate. Mm -hmm. There's also a Hollywood movie that came out a couple of years ago starring Paul Rudd. Oh. And I have to admit, I do not remember the title of that movie. Yeah, I can't remember uh, that. Yeah. Huh, no, it's easy to find. Okay. Um, it's fictionalized, but yeah. it's it, it's yeah, it's it's worth uh it's worth checking out. Uh -huh. Um so a lot of people over time have thought that Moberg was a spy during this tour. Mm -hmm. Um, I have looked into that. Other historians have looked into it as well. Mm -hmm. And basically we've all concluded that there's no evidence that he was a spy during this 1934 tour. Mm -hmm. Um, but he did some rather strange things. Mm -hmm. He did bring a movie camera. He snuck off and took movies yeah. of industrial sites and that, and, uh, he couldn't get into any military installations, but, but of, of areas that, um, you know, a normal tourist would not take pictures of. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, later during uh, World War II, there is stories that he gave uh, these films to the State Department, and that they may have been used during the uh, to help plan the Doolittle raid in Japan. Mm. Um, I don't think that's completely verified mm -hmm. whether they were actually used to help plan the raid. Um, the problem is that there were lots of other spies and lots of other intelligence at the same time. So sure. Mo Berg's contributions have often been uh, probably exaggerated, mm -hmm. but he was up to something uh, mm -hmm. during this 1934 tour. Mm -hmm. um, so what about Babe Ruth? Like, was he already known in Japan? Like, what uh, do we know anything about his thoughts about his experiences in Japan? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Babe Ruth was beloved in Japan long before he got there. He was mm -hmm. the most famous athlete of his time. Mm -hmm. um, one of the most famous people in the world, actually, at least in the baseball playing world. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Japanese promoters have been tr were trying to get Babe Ruth over for years oh. before he finally came up in 1934. Um, so most of the attention during the tour was focused on Ruth himself uh you can find him on the cover of magazines newspapers everywhere mm. um and babe ruth loved japan mm -hmm. he had just been well he wasn't released he had parted ways with the yankees right before coming over mm -hmm. uh, the yankees basically told him it was time for him to retire it was time for him to leave and he said no um exactly what was going to happen was unsure he ended up leaving the Yankees. Um, but he used the tour as kind of uh, a way to prove himself. And he ended up having the highest batting average, the most home runs, you know, winning all these awards for, yeah. for being a great player. But he really reveled in the attention. He loved being the star. And uh, as a result, he loved Japan. And he came back with, with suitcases full of souvenirs. Oh. And uh, uh, yes. And uh, so when, uh, during Pearl Harbor, the day of Pearl Harbor, Ruth actually felt personally betrayed by the Japanese. And there's this wonderful story that his uh, that his um, daughter, Julia Ruth Stevens, uh, told about when the news of Pearl Harbor came over the radio, Babe Ruth went into just, um, oh, what would be the right word? He just got crazy, he started running around the apartment. And he threw open the windows of his uh, apartment in New York City and started throwing out the window Japanese souvenirs that had, were decorating the apartment. Wow. And his daughter and his wife are running around, like grabbing the good stuff and running out to a different room, keeping it out of his reach. Wow. Um, he never got back to Japan. Um, he died, of course, what was it, 48? I'm mm -hmm. trying to remember off the top of my head. Um, but after the war, he did talk about reconciliation um, and saying that he would, you know, how much he enjoyed Japan when he was there, that he had hoped, had hoped to go back, but you know, it would never be. Mm 
Yeah. Wow. I mean, it I, seems like he felt like personally betrayed in a way, right? Like he, yes, he became this this fan of Japan and and really came to appreciate it, and then you know Japan became you know enemy number one or number two, you know Germany number one, number you know one of the top enemies basically, right? Right. So, oh wow. Okay. Um, yeah, no, th- this this story was super interesting, and I've I've been wanting to talk to you since since I I, I saw the lecture. So, oh, great. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so yeah, the the book is out now, but you've got tons of other books, um, including your the one that was published uh, most recently, which is about uh, Japanese baseball cards, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, um, so could you could you give us a little you know uh, absolutely yeah. let me first say that uh, so Bonsai Babe Ruth was published in 2012 mm-hmm. and since then I've written a biography of uh, Masanori Murakami the first uh, Japanese player in the majors mm-hmm. and also a book called Issei Baseball which talks about the first uh, Japanese American baseball teams of the early 20th mm-hmm. century mm-hmm. but the latest book is um, on Japanese baseball cards it's it's mm-hmm. um, it's a. It's actually a paperback. It was a pandemic project. Uh, mm-hmm. I had finished Issei Baseball. I was all ready to go out on a book tour to the West Coast in Japan, and then the pandemic hit, and <laughs> everything had to be canceled. Yeah. And I was sitting around going, "Wow, I'd you know plan to spend all of 2020 you know, promoting my book, and now it's it's very difficult to do that." Yeah. Um. So I started kind of goofing around and. I discovered um, creating an ebook, and I decided to um, just write a history of Japanese baseball cards, but it's illustrated. Mm -hmm. So the final book is a paperback, about 80 80 pages, uh, high gloss, um, thick uh, pages with uh, everything color, Um, and probably pictures of several hundred Japanese cards, plus a text explaining when Japanese baseball cards came out, the different Mm -hmm. types, how they changed through time, um, some of the great players in Japan. So uh, could, so what, what is Japanese baseball card culture like in Japan? Like would would they just sell packs? Did they come like with bubble gum or something? Like how, how, how did that whole thing get started? Well, actually biggest difference is in the United States, baseball cards were, originally and for most of its history sold as like prizes with food they were sold first with tobacco mm-hmm. then they were sold with uh, bubble gum and it's not until what late 80s uh well really by the 70s people were buying the cards and the gum came along with them mm-hmm. and then eventually by the 80s 90s got rid of the gum altogether yeah. um but in japan uh, they're more associated with children's games. So the most common um, Japanese baseball card historically was the Menko, which is uh, a flipping game. I don't know in Hawaii if you still play Pogs. Do you oh, remember those? I remember Pogs, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that came out of Hawaii, and it's basically a game based on the Japanese game of Menko, which are uh, oh. usually, but not always, uh, round cardboard discs that you throw and try to flip or land on other people's discs and then you get to keep them okay. um so the so many of the early japanese cards were these mekos and then they uh in the late 40s early 50s uh dice games baseball dice games became popular with statistics mm-hmm. on the back of the cards um and so that was another way that mm-hmm. uh, the cards entered uh, the market mm-hmm. um there were also pinups um, called, uh, that were always popular in Japan and postcards. Mm-hmm. Um, but it wasn't really until um, the 1970s, actually, they started being packaged with uh, potato chips, Calbi potato chips, oh. which <laughs> most Japanese are familiar with. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, and they also came with gum during the ni- late 50s and uh, 1960s. And then the 1990s, uh, Japanese baseball cards started uh, being marketed in their own right, where they were sold in packs like they are in the United States, just for collectors. Hmm. Um, 
I think um, in in America, you know, when when you think about valuable baseball cards, there's um, I, I think the name is Homer Wagner. Is that the the famous <laughs> close, one, right? close Honus Wagner? Honus yes. Wagner. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> not I'm not a baseball expert. I just kinda... <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> yeah. but you know, that's the kind of like the famous one, right? That people go, right. oh my god, that's the one that's valuable. Like, is there? Can you think of some equivalent in Japan, like some super like valuable baseball card or, or some baseball player that i don't know their card was super popular there is not a card like that um in uh -huh. general japanese baseball cards um are not as uh valuable as american cards hmm. um it's more of a supply and demand issue sure. um jap you know there's been a long history of adults collecting american baseball cards oh. and over recent decades uh, adults with means collecting them so it's not uncommon to see high qu quality and valuable american baseball cards go for hundreds of thousands of dollars now uh -huh. sometimes more sometimes even more than a million uh, that is unheard of in japan mm. um unless the collectors are buying american sure. um but so there is no one kind of holy grail um, well, I guess there is a holy grail in that there's a Japanese pitcher called uh, named Eiji Sawamura. Uh -huh. And Sawamura became famous during the 1934 tour where he almost beat the All-American team. Oh. He ended up losing a game one to nothing. Mm -hmm. And um, he became a, a national hero with that game. Mm -hmm. And then Sawamura was killed during World War II in action. Oh. Uh -huh. There are no known... Japanese baseball cards of Eiji Sawamura from the time he played um, because there weren't many sets. Uh, Japan was, let's see, I'm trying to remember my dates, but uh, second uh, Japanese-Chinese War was 37. Mm -hmm. is, is that when it started? I can't remember, but probably. <laughs> sounds about right. Yeah. 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 I should know this off the top of my head, but yeah. it's slipping. Sure. Um, so, Japanese professional baseball truly starts in uh, 1936. Um, and so by that time, there's already Japan is at war. Mm -hmm. And so things are already in short supply. So there are, mm -hmm. I want to say, no known baseball sets from the late 30s through the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. It's possible there may be a few out there that are very, very rare mm -hmm. that um, I don't know of. Mm -hmm. So Salamora has no cards that we know of. Um, mm -hmm. If one was to come across right. a verified Salamora card, you may not be looking at a million dollars, but you would be looking at a lot of money. Sure, 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 sure. Um, just out, out of curiosity, do you have a particularly like favorite player? Well, yeah, I'm partial to, to two players, one, um, both of whom I... I know well, uh, Wally Yonamine, uh -huh. uh, who I wrote his biography, sure. uh, who passed away, um, I guess, about 10 years ago now, oh. and, uh, and Mashi Mur Murakami, who I also wrote a biography of. So oh. both of these players I knew well. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, uh, yeah. they're two, my two favorite. And which, which teams did they play for in Japan? So uh, Yonamine played for the uh, Yomiri Giants uh -huh. and then the um, Junichi Dragons. Mm -hmm. um, Mashi played for, first for the San Francisco Giants and the Nankai Hawks. And he also played for um, the Fighters as well for a couple of seasons. Uh, mm. I think they were, they were um, Nippon Ham at the time, mm. Nippon Ham Fighters. Um, okay, so uh, I, you told me before we got started, but like you're, you're working on some other stuff. Seems like you've always got stuff, uh, you know, cooking. <laughs> I always do. That's what I, this is what I do for fun. So yes, I have to have a project. Um, I finished a book uh, late last year. It's another um, home published book, which I've really fallen in love with that kind of way of, of producing material. Yeah. Um, and this one is another picture book. Um, it's called the pioneers of Japanese American baseball. Uh -huh. And it's a picture book introduction to the early players of and teams of Japanese American baseball. Uh -huh. um, but right now I am working on a very large project um, for the Society of American Baseball Research. Uh -huh. We're doing a two volume set on the baseball tours of Japan. Uh -huh. 
So a chapter on every professional um, team from North America that went over to Japan from uh, 1907 until uh, 2000, I think, 18, I think, is the last year that we cover. Um, And this this book will be be out end of this year, uh, beginning of next year. Mm. And uh, we, it's an edited volume. We have, I think, about 40 to 50 different authors wow. who've contributed to this from both Japan and the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, and the idea is to just get in one place. If you're interested in what, you know, who came over to Japan before, or you're interested in the 1955 Yankees tour or the uh, 1970 San Francisco Giants tour, you can find it all in one place. You can find a, a about a 5,000 word discussion of the tour followed by the statistics and the results of the tour. That's a very cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that will be a very, very useful and, and great resource for many people that are interested in this sort of thing. That's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So just to close out, I'm wondering, is there anything um, Japan baseball related that um, you would love to do? Is there anybody that, maybe uh, alive or not alive that you would love to have a conversation with uh, anything you can think of that, that you have not been able to do that you would be your like dream to get to do. Oh, there's so many, so many. <laughs> uh, what I would really like to do is wake up one morning, and be able to read Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> there's so much written out there that yeah. I can't get to that. Um, uh, you know, when it's when it's one of my projects and I'm writing a book, yeah. I work with people in Japan. I hire translators. I hire research assistants who can go into the archives for me, you know, and answer my questions. But I can't read casually. And there's yeah. so many wonderful books written by Japanese authors um, that I would love to sit down and read. And then I'd love to go talk to the players, which I can't really do beyond, you know, hi, nice to meet you. you (laughs) So that would be my ultimate dream. Uh, Unfortunately, I love baseball research. I love to write. And the time I've tried many times to start my Japanese and what always comes after about a year, I look at it and go, wow, this is harder than I thought. Yeah. And I'm not writing. I'm not doing what I really love. Thing. Yeah. 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 So it's, I it's time consuming. Yeah. To get to that yeah. level. It, yeah. Definitely. It really is. Yeah. Have, have you had uh, much of a chance to like interview some of the people like that, that have come over here, like the Japanese players that end up have played here in, in the MLB? That's a great question. And no, I haven't. Mm. Um, and that comes to, from access. Mm. So, Current players, both in Japan and in the United States, are stars. They're yeah. hard to get to, yeah. right? Yeah. And I, I'm a geeky baseball historian. I'm not a, uh, a, a beat writer. So sure. I don't have access to the, um, to the clubhouses. Um, yeah. And um, so as a result, yeah, I don't, I don't get to go meet the players and talk yeah. to them on the field. I mean, I have in the mm-hmm. past, but the interviews we've done have all been very brief. Um, so no, the answer is not, I have not met, uh, Hideki Matsui or yeah. Otani. I'd love to someday just to you know, say hi, yeah. um, it'd be wonderful to actually have a true interview with them, but yeah. uh, I've never had the opportunity. Yeah. And like, I mean, for the most part, when they, when these players and, and, you know, we can go back to like the nineties, the the, you know, and on, you know, there's been many players that have come, you know, in, in the past couple of decades over to the MLB, but in Japan, they are regarded as, you know, the top of the top. Like, you know, like I'm sure getting access to them would be quite tricky, regardless of, of whether you're in the U.S. or in Japan. <laughs> I think so. I, I mean, I think, um, yeah, it would have to, it would probably have to be done with, you know, hey, I know so-and-so. Exactly. I work with, I work with his brother, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know let's go out for a beer. <laughs> I think it would have to be done that way yeah, uh, yeah, to yeah. really get a, a good interview. Um, yes. Yeah. I think one of the ways I was able to start is a lot of the retired American ball players who played Mm. in the fifties and sixties, um, are very happy to talk about, you know, their, their past lives as ball players and they're not the superstars. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, Mm. but, um, most of them, at least the ones who played in Japan weren't such superstars that they, they're not, they're easy to get access to. Yeah. yeah. And, and so with current players, it's, it's very hard. Mm-hmm. Well, 
for anybody that's curious, um, and and again, I I think the story of Banzai Babe Ruth is super fascinating. So you know that book is is I think a great place to start, regardless of whether you're into baseball or not. There is so much history there, so much behind the scenes between the the the, the what was going on in, in the front of the baseball. You know, there's all the politics, all the you know attempted assass- assassinations and all that. I think that is a great place to start. But uh, you've got tons of books, so people can go check out your website. They can look you up on. Amazon, yep. there's tons. I will put the link in the show notes so anybody curious they could go check out all all your work. So wonderful, and I'm happy yes. to answer questions. If anybody yes. uh, goes to my website and has a you know question, wants to email me, I yep. I respond as quickly as I can. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you. It's been my pleasure, Zoni. Again, thank you so much, Robert. It was wonderful talking to you. And if you want to learn more about Robert and his work and his books, go check out his website, robfitz.com. I will include a link in the show notes to Bonsai Babe Ruth and, and all the relevant links. Just go check it out in your podcast app, or you can visit japanstationpodcast.com where I put up all the blog posts for all of the episodes. So again, thank you, Robert. Go check out those links, guys. And if you want to support the show and maybe you're going to pick up one of Robert's books and you're going to do it on Amazon, well, you can use japankyo.com slash Amazon. That will send me a tiny, tiny percentage of whatever you purchase. Won't cost you anything extra and and, uh, we all win so consider using that japanko.com slash amazon don't forget to rate and review the podcast and make sure to follow on whatever podcast platform you use follow on facebook and twitter at japanko news and of course thank you thank you thank you so much to you know me for allowing me to use the song oedo controller as the opening and closing song uh that does it for this episode go check out the latest episode of ichimon japan that one is all about Yoshoku, Japanese Western food, kind of. Uh, go listen to it. So um, just a quick last note here. So I'm going to be in Finland uh, roughly the first week of June. So if you're listening to this as soon as it comes out, I may be um, on the airplane on my way to Finland. So just going to go travel, going to do something totally different. Unfortunately, you know, I, I've been pretty much stuck on uh, the island of Oahu here in Hawaii for just about the entire pandemic. I, I, I got to go to Florida for a little bit for some family stuff. But um, other than that, you know, I, I, I didn't get to travel. I haven't been able to go to Japan. Um, and so I just decided to go somewhere different and I'm going to have a wonderful time, I'm sure, in, in Finland. Um, I'm, I'm going to meet somebody that I, I met, at one of the patrons. So thank you so much. <laughs> it's going to be a wonderful experience, um, I'm sure. And I'm going to eat some good food and just have a wonderful time. But because of that, uh, the June release schedule for the Japan Pankyo podcast is going to be a little wonky. Um, I'm not going to release an Ichimon Japan episode on the 7th like I normally would. I will do my best to release one on the 21st. Um, No promises. And I will do my best to release something on the 15th uh, for uh, Japan Station, or at least on the Japan Station feed. Um, we'll see if that works out. But um, if if I can't, I, I apologize in advance, but July uh, will be back to normal. So uh, don't, don't go anywhere. Hit that subscribe button or that follow button so that when the episodes start coming out again, uh, it, it shows up in your podcast app or whatever, you know. So again, so apologies, but again, July will be back to normal. But until then, Thank you so much for listening and remember, go find your miniature pony. Just do it!